So I want to welcome people who are here in person and people who are on Zoom to this meeting of the Science and Engineering Council. Um, we have monthly lunch meetings now hybrid. Um, so you're welcome to sign up to come here to Community West Bank, and we thank them for their for hosting us. And um, if you haven't been to Science and Engineering Council meetings before, our meetings are focused on science and engineering topics, and uh, a lot of times climate related. And so um, we have a membership. Which Join as a member and get a discount on meetings. And um, our board members who are here are Bill Berenger and uh, Robert Lilly is on Zoom, and myself, oh, and Joseph Strongs, who's a board member, and I am the program chair. Um, oh, and my name's Yvonne DeGraw. Uh, so let's see. Um, I think the next thing to do is for me to talk about upcoming meetings, which our next meeting will be on June 14th, and we'll be announcing the topic by email. So if you get our emails, you'll hear about that. Keep an eye out for it. I am looking for talk for speakers on artificial intelligence and uh, you know chat GPT. So if anyone knows someone local uh, willing to speak about that sort of thing, though everything changes. I guess every week or every day on that front. So hard to, to plan your talk in advance. <laughs> um, today, we're happy to have Dr. Ben Helper speaking to us. He is both the director of the National Center for Ecological Analysis and the Synthesis, or ENSYS, and a professor at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at UCSB. His research into food production related greenhouse gas emissions, freshwater use, and habitat disturbance has been in the news recently, including in articles in the Washington Post and The Guardian. Dr. Halpern received his PhD in marine ecology in 2003 from UCSB and then held a joint postdoc at NCS and the Smith Fellowship Program. He was a research associate at MCs for the decade following that until joining the faculty at the Brent School. In the past 20 years, Dr. Halpern has published over 275 peer-reviewed articles and was named one of the world's most influential scientific mind finds by Thomson Reuters. He is a fellow of the California Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the Ecological Society of America. His awards include the H. E. Huntsman, Excellence in Marine Science by the Royal Society of Canada, the Peter Benchley Ocean Award for Excellence in Science, and the Ocean Award in Science. We are very happy today to have Dr. Halpert speak to us on the environmental footprint of global food production. So go ahead and share your screen. Welcome, Dr. Halpert. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and all of you for taking the time to uh, share this moment with me and hear about the work I'm, I've been doing and, and that we're continuing to do. Um, I'll just briefly mention the center that I direct, this National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Uh, you may not know that UCSB has a downtown department. That's the center. We're actually located on uh, Anacapa and Figaro, right by the courthouse, so downtown. I'm not, not sure where you guys are at the moment, but probably close to there. Um, but anyway, we're a, a science center that's really focused on finding uh, research that informs solutions to environmental problems uh, around the world. And we cover everything you can imagine. We've been around for 28 years and we're a great resource for the community writ large, but certainly for Santa Barbara. So I uh, encourage you to learn a little bit more about that or reach out to me to, to learn more. I'd be happy to, to share more about that. But today I'm gonna talk about my own personal research. Um, as Yvonne said, it's been in the news lately, uh, that's focused on understanding, calculating, and, and mapping the environmental footprint of global food production. And this project started about five years ago, really in part inspired by a personal journey. I, I had wanted to um, make decisions about my diet that were environmentally sustainable. And I had read some research and certainly read news stories about, well, there's thousands of them about different diets and what they can do for you and for the planet. 
And I had made a decision to um, become a vegetarian based on that and still eat some fish. So I kind of made that choice to cut meat out of my diet. But I didn't really know if that was scientifically informed or just kind of what the media had picked up on and what I could glean from reading a few articles here and there. And so this question of what um, I should eat and maybe what we should eat to be environmentally sustainable really sparked my interest in trying to understand what aspects of our diet um, lead to greater or less environmental sustainability? What is the environmental consequence, the environmental footprint of our food choices? And, you know, there are lots of diets out there. You know, I chose to be a vegetarian with some fish, so I guess that's pescatarian, but you can really think of many different ways to structure your diet and it can feel overwhelming. And what I wanted to do is look across all of the data, the evidence, and pull that together to come up with um, some guidance that I was interested in using to inform my decisions about food choice. But I wanna set the stage a little bit more about why I was interested in this, and I hope I can motivate you to be interested in thinking about your diet a little bit more um, in the sense of its environmental uh, consequence or its environmental sustainability. So first, as you can see here, uh, agriculture uses 70% of all freshwater resources worldwide. You know, it leaves 30% for everything else, our drinking water, cooking, industry, bathing, everything else. So it's a lot goes to agriculture. So that means if we can grow food with less water, that's great for the planet. And it's also just great for all the other things we need fresh water for. Food also contributes about a third of all climate emissions. Uh, so if we want to address climate change, we have to address food production as a major contributor to those greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, if we leave it as it is and solve the other emissions problems, we're still going to have a lot of climate emissions from food production alone. And then finally, just further setting the stage, you know, we have converted uh, over 40% of all of our ice-free land on our planet into crops or pasture land. So almost half, and that means you know the rest is there for biodiversity, for our urban uses, our suburban uses, our industrial uses. So uh, a lot of our planet we have turned over to food production, which means anything we can do to reduce that footprint of where food is grown or produced leaves more space for other species and for our other uses of the planet. So food's a big deal. What you've probably seen in um, stories about food production, if you've been paying attention to the news on this, are things like this, a plot like this, where um, the evidence is stacked up in these charts comparing foods, in this case, for their um, climate emissions, CO2 equivalents. And it's uh, basically for every um, pound or kilogram of food that you see here, how many emissions are produced from that. And you can see that goats and, and lamb, in this case, sheep, um, top the chart. You've probably heard a lot about beef, which it does have very high emissions, but actually per kilogram of food, goats and, and sheep are actually higher. But in any case, you see a, a kind of a rank order or stacking of these different foods against this measure, in this case, climate emissions. But these studies and that example show that um, nearly all of the work on understanding foods, environmental sustainability has been siloed. They look at one issue like that example of, of climate emissions, or they look at one food, like they just look at, at beef. Um, and that's not enough to really make full comparisons. We really need comprehensive and comparable measures across the many different aspects of how food affects our planet. As Yvonne said, I'm a marine ecologist by background. I've, I've studied a lot about wild-caught fisheries and aquaculture in the ocean. And those seafood components are often left out of these comparisons. And I particularly wanted to understand how seafood compared, but really also how it all stacks up together. And importantly, how it compares across multiple measures of the environmental footprint of food production. So that's one key thing missing. The second is nearly all of these studies look at the per unit, per pound, or per kilogram um, uh, environmental consequence of food production, which is super useful. We 
eat a pound or a kilogram of food at a meal or per day, roughly. So for a personal daily choice, that's kind of the right unit to be thinking of. But for the planetary consequence of food production, you have to pay attention to volume of production as well. So for example, if you have something that's really horrible for the planet, but you grow one plant of it, uh, who cares? It's just like a so small amount, it's not a problem. But if you have something that's medium bad, but you grow a billion tons of it, that's gonna have a huge planetary consequence. And so we really need to be paying attention to not only the per unit impact of uh, food production, but also the volume of it. And then finally, almost none of these studies have mapped where things are actually happening, but that's what you really need if you wanna start making smart decisions about where to grow what and where to buy different food products from in order to minimize the environmental footprint or to maximize the environmental sustainability. So we set about five years ago to address these three key gaps in, in the literature, in the science, and the evidence for the sustainability of food. I'm going to show you the results for what we found. But before I jump into the results, I want to set the stage um, with the methods, and I promise I'll keep it brief, but I want to give you the sense of the scope of what we were able to do in the last five years and what we included in our analysis. So first of all, we looked at all four broad categories of food production. So we have livestock, the animals on land, aquaculture. So this is um, shellfish and fish that we grow in the water, all the various crops, and then wild caught fisheries. And within each of these four broad categories, we keep track of all the individual groups of, of food that are under those broad categories. And for each of these broad categories, we track the many different aspects of food production that lead to environmental footprint or environmental consequence. So for example, with livestock, we look at the manure that's produced. So this creates uh, nitrogen pollution and climate emissions. We look at the feed that goes into feeding those animals. We look at the land use and infrastructure needed to house and, and grow those animals, the water consumption from them that they drink, and the enteric fermentation, the burps and farts that they produce as they digest their food, right? So each of these broad categories has these different metrics or aspects of the food production that lead to environmental pressures associated with food production. And then we look at the big four environmental pressures. So greenhouse gas emissions, GHG. So those are the climate change driving emissions from food production. The disturbance of the land or the ocean that happens by placing food production in a particular location. The nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, the N and P, those, that's the pollution that comes from food production. And then the freshwater use. So those are the big four. There are other things like disease transmission, non-native uh, genetics like GMO kind of aspects of food production that people pay attention to for sure. But these are the big four. And if we can capture these four, we get a handle on pretty much the main drivers of environmental footprint. And so then we catalog, it's a massive accounting exercise of keeping track of each aspect of each food category for each food product within those food categories and each of these um, types of pressures that are associated with them. Not all activities have all pressures, as you can see in this matrix of colors, but across all of that, we catalog everything that happens. And then with those catalogs in place, we can measure and map the individual pressures, which I'll show you. And we can also measure and map the cumulative or the sum of those four pressures. And that cumulative pressure is really the, the environmental footprint metric that we focus on, because it's across all four of those things, not any individual one siloed on its own. And that gives us a more complete, comprehensive understanding of the environmental footprint of food production. And we do this for 99% of all um, food that's reported globally, so pretty much everything. We don't have information on the vegetables you grow in your backyard. We don't keep track of that. We don't have information on what people hunt in the forest, if they hunt deer, like those things aren't recorded. So there's definitely food production and consumption that happens that's not part of what we do, but everything on a global scale that's reported, which is a lot, most of it, we have that in our assessment. And then, like I said, we account for both the per kilogram or per pound efficiencies, like we, we showed in that original bar chart, 
and then also the volume of production so that we really get a handle of the planetary consequences of this food production. So that's it for, for methods, but I wanted to really hammer home that it's comprehensive and it's a massive accounting exercise to make sure we keep track of all this. That's why it took five years to do this. So I wanna tell you this story in, in five vignettes or five take home messages that I, I hope you um, leave this presentation with and, and then think about moving forward. Um, so the first is that the environmental footprint of global food production is highly concentrated. What do I mean by that? So here's a map of that cumulative environmental footprint of, of food production. And you can see those red spots are the top 1% of the area on our planet that uh, is producing the most environmental footprint from food production. And in fact, those red areas, that top 1% of the planet produces 40% of all environmental pressure from global food production. Even more amazing to me is the top 10%, so just 10% of our planet creates basically all of the environmental footprint from global food production. So this concentration has a positive and a negative side, at least one of each. The, the one positive is that because it's so concentrated, we have clear areas we can target for mitigating those pressures. If we can take action in India and in China and Europe, parts of North America, and reduce the environmental footprint in those bright red spots, we can have big bang for the buck, kind of big return on our investment for mitigating the environmental footprint print in those places. One of the big negatives, of course, is because it's so highly concentrated, people that live near those areas are likely to be experiencing the greatest consequences of the environmental footprint of that food production. So there's likely to be some inequity in who is paying the cost for our global food production. So that's the cumulative pressure. I'll just quickly show you each of the four individual maps to get a sense of what's happening for those four individual pressures. And you'll see some pretty similar patterns because they, they add up together, but some differences as well. So this is um, the land disturbance or ocean disturbance. You can see that really light yellow in the, in the ocean. That's from fishing where global fishing happens. But you can see it's very concentrated in India, China, uh, Europe, and North America again, with Western Africa and South America also having some, some hot spots of disturbance. So this is where the greatest amount of land and ocean disturbance is happening from food production. We see a similar, but actually more widespread um, footprint from the nutrient pollution, the phosphorus and, and nitrogen um, runoff from uh, food production. Same, similar hotspots, but much broader spread across Africa, Australia, North America, every continent really. For water, it's even more um, widespread, still some of those key hotspots, but almost every part of the planet is um, having its water resources used for food production. And then finally, greenhouse gas emissions, the climate change uh, driving emissions, also are fairly widespread, again, with similar hotspots as we saw before, but large swaths of almost every continent driving um, climate emissions. So those are the individual components. Uh, together, again, the, we see the very concentrated nature of these cumulative pressures. Um, and that's really the, the take home message I want to, to leave you with. We can look at that in one other way that I wanted to, well, we can look at it in many ways, but one other way I wanted to show you that you can um, package up all of this information that we've gathered to look at individual country comparisons. And again, we can only do this because we've mapped everything for the first time, and then we can bundle it back up into different reporting units. So here we see the top 20 or 25 countries. And I'll just point out, um, China and India as two comparisons, each country contributes about 15% of the total global environmental pressures from food production, but they do it in pretty different ways. So India, well over half of it, maybe two thirds of it is for crops for human consumption, that dark orange bar, whereas for China, it's less than half. And in, con conversely for um, China, they have a large portion of it going to livestock feed that dark green bar, whereas in India, that's very little. And you can do other comparisons like that. China has a much larger marine fisheries, that dark blue bar at the, at the beginning. So these are the kinds of uh, assessments we can do with this information. And you can compare and contrast countries to understand 
how much they're contributing to global en environmental footprint of food production, and which types of foods are contributing how much of each kind of pressure. And in this case, in this plot, the cumulative pressure, the sum of all those individual pressures. These top 20 countries <clears throat> account for over 70% of the global cumulative pressure. And the top five, India, China, United States, Brazil, and Pakistan account for almost half, 45%. Now, those are big countries with lots of people in them, those top five, so that's not terribly surprising, but it's really important to know, and it guides our thinking about where there are opportunities to really make a big difference in thinking about new policy and new um, behavior around which foods we eat to really make a difference, not only at your local and country level, but at a global level because of the large com contribution of those countries to the global environmental footprint. So that's the first story, the first vignette. The second one is about the rank order of foods. So I started with that plot of the greenhouse gas emissions rank order of foods. I now wanna give you a new rank order that comes from these cumulative environmental footprint pressure assessments that we've done. And they're gonna be different than what you've heard in the news and we can dive into why and how they're different. So I'm gonna show you plots like this they are stacked bars of the contribution of the different um, sources of pressure, these four different buckets, disturbance, greenhouse gas emissions, nutrient pollution, and water in the different colors. And in this case, because they're livestock, there's contribution both from the direct animal growth and the feed that we contribute or that we feed to the animals. So you can see those color coded here in the different um, colors of bars. And what you see, is across these four pressures, cumulatively, at a global scale, accounting for production volume, pigs are the number one troublemaker. So you've heard a lot about cows, and indeed, cows have really large climate emissions. You can actually still see that um, in this plot here, where the pink bar for cow's meat is very large. It's the largest of anything. So that is still holds true. If you care about climate emissions, cows are the worst. But when you account for all four of these pressures, cumulatively, pigs top the list. And then if we start looking at other um, food production, so those vertical bars help you keep track of equivalent values. So the x-axis is the proportion of global environmental pressures from each food. So just to, to anchor you, pigs account for almost 15% of the global environmental footprint for all food. Cows are about 13%. Those are the top two bars. And you can see the scale gets stretched in these lower ones on the x-axis, just so you can see the values a little bit more. So that's what those horizontal, I mean, sorry, the vertical bars are helping you keep track of. So in this middle plot, we have all our wild-caught fisheries. These words may be foreign to you, but demersal means the bottom fish that live on the bottom of the ocean, and we drag big trawl nets to scoop them up. So there's a lot of disturbance of the seafloor, that's the brown bar, and there's a lot of emissions, a lot of diesel fuel that's taken to drag those really heavy nets across the ocean floor. That's why these demersal fish have a larger pink bar emissions from that fuel use. And you can see other wild caught fisheries, they get smaller and smaller cumulative pressures. And then the mariculture, these are the farmed animals. So shrimp have a pretty large cumulative environmental um, footprint, uh, probably close to 11%. Um, because they have a large disturbance footprint, a lot of um, emissions as well, as well as, you know, they, they require um, feed, they, they're a fed organism. So you get these stacked up and you can see kind of the rank order of all these different foods. These are all the crops. Um, you can see rice and wheat at the top there, large water footprints associated with these crops, also with uh, rice in particular, large emissions, the pink bar. Um, with uh, you know rice and wheat each accounting for almost 10% of the global total global environmental footprint of food production. So what does that mean when we put it all together? It gets harder to read all this in one plot, but the take-homes are the top five foods in order for their global cumulative environmental footprint are pig, number one, cow, rice, wheat, and milk. And I'm guessing rice and wheat were not what you were expecting, but you look and they stack up at nearly 10% of total footprint each. And we'll get to that in a, a later vignette message about why 
uh, but it relates to the production volume. So I'll show you that in a bit. Importantly, fisheries, the wild caught fisheries, don't have two of the key pressures. They don't, they're wild stocks. They live in the wild in the ocean, so they don't take any water to grow them. And they uh, don't produce any nutrient pressures because they're just wild animals. We don't keep track of their general poop. It's only when you're farming something that you keep track of that. And so by nature, uh, wild caught fisheries have a much higher probability of having a lower footprint because there's two of those four key things don't occur with that food production. And then I, what I've hoped this really hammers home is that when you pay attention to cumulative pressures, as we've done here, and you account for production volume, which we've done here, you get a really different story than what you read in the news normally. This is a very different rank order than that typical uh, message you get from the media because we've accounted for things in a much more comprehensive way than is typically done. So the third vignette or story I want to share with you is around how the efficiency of any given food is highly variable. So where you grow it really makes a difference. And this creates all sorts of interesting challenges and opportunities. So I'm going to show you one other kind of plot. Uh, that helps tell this story. So we're going to look at goat meat just as a starter here. And each one of those dots you see there is a different country. So there's about 215, I think, countries that we keep track of. Each dot is one of those countries. And I've color-coded six of them just to help you kind of see some of the patterns that emerge. Um, the uh, little box you see there is the, the median value and then the 25 and 75th percent Quartile, so it kind of gives you a sense of the average essentially in that box with the variation among countries spread out around that. So in this case of the six that I've color coded, India is the highest. It's the least efficient um, or high inefficiency, which is its cumulative pressure per ton of protein produced. And the purple one, Russia, it's hard to see, but it's on the further left side, which makes it the more efficient, so better, more sustainable, um, production of goat meat. And across these six countries, it's it's pretty variable. And then across all of the countries, it's it's highly variable. So now we're going to look at this across a bunch of different foods, all of them actually. And in this case, you see a, a rank order of foods that is more similar to what we saw with the climate emissions. So this is, um, again, cumulative pressure across all four of those pressures, but goat and sheep meat top the list, then cattle, then pigs, then the milk categories, and then chicken. But what you'd see in particular is that any given one of these foods, there's huge variation among countries, less so with the chicken, but still a lot of variation. And there's also a different rank order of, food, of countries. You see the color-coded ones kind of flipping their order among different foods as some countries are more or less efficient in producing different food types. As we add in the other food groups, we see um, basically getting more and more efficient as we move into um, wildcat seafood and then um, mariculture, but there are things like shrimp that are still pretty inefficient. And again, those um, benthic, the bottom uh, demersal fish are also not particularly uh, efficient. And again, lots of variation among countries. I'm gonna tell you that story in a bit more. Putting it all together, um, the take home messages from this, many crops and seafood are very efficient. You can see that most of the values are clustered to the, the far left, which is greater efficiency. But there is wide vari variation among countries. Just for crops alone, you can see anywhere from two and a half to eight and a half times variation from one country to the next in its environmental footprint or its environmental sustainability. That's a huge range of values. For fisheries, it can be up to 22 times variation among countries. That's a lot. So I'll just give one example to illustrate a little bit of the kind of the detail that we can mine from all this information to understand what's going on. So here's soy production. The United States is the number one soy producer in the world. India, I think is number three or four. And the United States is about three times more efficient or more sustainable than India in its soy production. And there's lots of reasons for that. We have access to better um, seed stock genetics of the seed that allow us to grow soy more productively. Uh, we have rules and regulations that limit the amount of um, 
pollution that we can have from our farms. So we got less environmental footprint. We have tractors and other infrastructure that allows us to harvest at a higher efficiency and so on. So there's lots of reasons for this, but it, it highlights how you can look at these comparisons among countries to really understand what's driving the differences and then think about what that means for decisions, especially at the policy level for trade and incentives for growing different types of food in different places. We also see lots of variation among foods within countries. So for example, if you look at Indonesia, <clears throat> pigs are about seven times less efficient than cows. So if you're in Indonesia and you wanna eat some meat, you'd be much better off in that case eating cows than pigs, a lot better, because it's a huge difference in their efficiencies for these cumulative pressures. And you can do this over and over again for any comparison you're interested. And then uh, two final points, as I've said already, the rank order of countries changes per food. It's how those colored dots are moving their, their relative position on, on these plots for any given food. So that's how you think about some countries are better than others and, and vice versa, depending on which food you're looking at. And then as I've said already, these differences really create interesting policy and trade opportunities to think about how to create, sorry, to, to produce food more sustainably at a global scale. Okay, my fourth story or vignette is all about the role of feed in understanding environmental sustainability of food production. So there's a couple of things that drive this story. First of all, is anything that fed, is fed has what we call a conversion ratio, which is basically how much food you need to give that animal to get one pound of body mass. And that's not even edible body mass. So in this case, it takes almost seven pounds of feed to create one pound of cattle. It's about three pounds of feed for one pound of pig, two to one for chickens, and about one to one for farm-raised fish. So these conversion ratios have a huge influence on the environmental sustainability of food production because you have a lot of feed that needs to go into growing something that we then ultimately can eat ourselves. It's just inefficient by definition. And some animals are way less efficient than others. The other aspect of feed that's really interesting is that as our global market uh, has these multinational corporations, <clears throat> there is a lot of homogenization of feed. So we did a separate analysis where we looked at just chicken and just farm salmon to look at their total environmental footprint globally. And if you look at these, if you squint, they look pretty darn similar. And the reason is that the feed that is given to chicken and farmed salmon is very, very similar. So we actually feed anchovies and sardines, these wild caught forage fish to chicken. And that's why chicken has an ocean footprint. And we feed soy and corn and other crops to farmed salmon, which is why farmed salmon has a land footprint. And so this feed is really actually driving a big part of the nature and the extent of the footprint of these fed animals because it's, it's homogenizing the way that we um, grow food. It also means there's some really simple rules you can use to think about environmental sustainability of your food production and your diet choices. Anything that doesn't need feed is inherently gonna likely have a better chance of a, a lower footprint. Doesn't guarantee it, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But all crops, all wild-caught fisheries, and some um, aquaculture like clams and mussels and oysters that are not fed, those things have a better chance of being more environmentally sustainable. Anything with feed, with these dark colored bars, as I've already said, is a much higher chance of having a higher environmental footprint. And I'll just show you two examples. If you can see at the top of your screen, I highlighted in the red boxes, the component of pig meat production that comes from feed alone. And it's about a third. So a, a, almost a third of pigs' environmental footprint is due to the feed that we produce and, grow, and feed to the animal. Look at another example for shrimp. It's just under a third um, for shrimp. And so again, you have a large proportion of the environmental footprint of these fed organisms, fed animals coming from feed. Now that suggests 
Uh, anything you can do to eat less fed animal is a good thing for environmental sustainability, but it's also got an interesting opportunity that comes into the more science, uh, technology and engineering space where if you can um, innovate in that feed space, you have a chance of really reducing the environmental footprint of food production while not needing to change the diet that we eat. So there's a lot of really cool stuff happening, in particular through aquaculture feeds, but it's, it's in um, livestock feeds as well that are using things like mealworms or microalgae or single cell proteins or um, anaerobic digestion of wood pulp and things like that that produce um, feed components that are actually really high quality uh, feed and many of them at a much lower environmental footprint because you don't you grow them in a lab in a tank for the most part so you don't need land you don't need a whole lot of water you need energy basically and so there's a chance of doing some really cool innovation in the feed area to make a real big difference you actually may have heard in the news the last few months about this exciting preliminary work around feeding seaweed to cows. And if they put just a little bit of seaweed in the diet of, of cows, it, it seems to reduce their, their climate emissions by up to 15%. That's huge, right? Like if you can, with a really, really simple change to the diet that the cows don't even know about, and you can reduce their climate emissions that much, that's amazing, right? So the feed also, even though it points to where food production has a, a likelihood of a much larger environmental footprint. It also is an opportunity for really interesting, innovative technological solutions to environmental footprint. And then the last story, the last vignette I want to share with you is to really hammer home the difference between thinking about foods from their efficiency rank order and the production volume rank order. So I've focused on the production volume in particular, but I, I also showed you those plots of efficiency. And I want to just give you a little more understanding of why these things matter and how they guide our thinking about food production. So I'm going to show you these two plots again, but pull out some examples that really illustrate this. So the top are these efficiency scores. So this is per kilogram of, in this case, livestock. And on the bottom is the total cumulative environmental footprint of those same animals. So let's take pig's meat. You can see it's ranked fourth in its efficiency, so it's not great. Lots of variability. But we produce just an enormous number of pigs globally, 800 million pigs per year, which is a lot of pigs, right? So they're not particularly efficient. So they're <clears throat> sort of not sustainable. And we grow a huge number of them. And that's why when you calculate it all together, you get pigs as the top um, food for its cumulative environmental footprint. If we take another example, chickens, which are much more efficient, more sustainable of the, all the livestock, they're the most sustainable. Um, but you account for the absolutely enormous production volume. We, we produce and, and slaughter 60 billion chickens per year around the world. So even though they're relatively efficient, the production volume is just absolutely enormous. And that's why collectively their cumulative environmental footprint is ranked fourth. It's about 4% of the total global environmental footprint of food production. So this is this difference and interaction between the efficiency of a food, which is what most people pay attention to, and that and accounting for the production volume, which is thinking about the planetary consequence of food production, which is what we focused on here. I'll give just two more examples from the crops those rice and wheat ones that you're probably still scratching your head about. So if we look at rice, this isn't all the crops, but it's it's medium efficiency, not too, not terrible, but not great. <clears throat> but we, again, produce just an absolute enormous amount of rice globally, 500 million tons per year. So together, that makes it the number one crop in terms of its cumulative environmental footprint and the number three food overall. It's just the volume of production is truly enormous. We look at wheat, and it's more efficient than rice, not dramatically so, but more efficient than rice. But again, just a truly enormous production volume, 780 million tons per year. And so that makes it the number two crop in terms of its cumulative environmental footprint. So again, it's this tension of the per kilogram or per pound efficiency, which is one way of looking at it. It's more the individual choice perspective, what you eat on a daily basis, 
And then the planetary scope or scale of things, which is this production volume that really tells us which foods are driving environmental change at a global scale. So what do you do with all this information? I know that's a lot. Some of it feels conflicting. It's an enormous amount of information to digest and make sense of. I've given you, I hope, some key take-home messages about things that you should be thinking about. But what does it mean for your choices of food? And before I answer that question, I just want to highlight that I've really focused on the environmental sustainability or environmental footprint of food production, which is an important reason to make um, diet choices, but it's not the only one. Many people make choices about not eating meat because of animal welfare concerns, or they don't eat certain kinds of meat. As most people make decisions, well, at least they try to anyway, around nutritional decisions um, about which um, diets are most nutritious. Lots of people make decisions about what food to eat based on social justice issues about how um, farm labor is treated in different food sectors. And of course, many people, including in Santa Barbara, make choices about supporting local farmers, local food producers, because they believe in supporting their, their local community. All of these are absolutely valid and important reasons for making diet choices. I focus today on the environmental sustainability side. So if we do that, we focus on the environmental sustainability. Here are just a few possible um, messages about things you can do to make a difference. So the first ones are on the personal choice decision, what you can do individually, daily, uh, with choices you make about what you eat. First, I'd say eat less farmed meat if you can. Uh, I know it's, if you eat meat, it's delicious. It's hard to cut it out completely, that's fine. But if you eat five portions of meat a week, maybe eat four or three a week. Any small changes added up across many, many people changing their diet a little bit will make a big difference. So that's number one. The second one, I would recommend eating more mussels, oysters, and clams. These things are like magical food. They uh, are mostly farmed. We don't do many wild harvest of these. They don't take any feed. They don't take any water. They actually can clean nutrients out of the water. They create habitat, so they actually restore ecosystems. They're super nutritious, and, and, and actually um, some studies have shown like the, the zinc and other micronutrients in oysters can help with depression, so doctors are starting to prescribe them for, for those kinds of issues, and so they're a magical food. You can kind of eat them almost guilt-free. Uh, it's great. And then one I like to throw in, uh, it's not a perfect, there's some exceptions to this, but in general, uh, eating invasive species is a twofer, like you get to eat the animal, <clears throat> or the plant, and it removes that invasive species from the environment. So I was just in Hawaii recently. There's an enormous number of uh, invasive wild well, feral pigs there. They do horrible damage to the environment. And they're really tasty. They like feed on macadamia nuts and mangoes. And so they go wild, wild hunt them. Uh, you can eat them and kind of guilt-free on that case too. So these are like just some examples of the personal choice decisions you can make to improve the environmental sustainability of your diet. And then on the voice side, so I hope I've um, convinced you that we also need to be thinking about the planetary scale of food production. And to do that, we have to engage policy and decision-making uh, management at the state or the local state, national, and ultimately international scale if we really want to make a difference. So engage locally. Salud Carbajal is on the committee that's helping craft the farm bill for the United States. So we've got a local representative who's got a, his finger in the pot there for really making a difference. There's lots of things we can do in Santa Barbara County or the state that can guide uh, food policy that uh, really can make a difference with California's commitment to you know, climate neutrality. Food has to be a big part of that. If the constituents are advocating for loudly to make sure that happens in sustainable ways. And we're looking beyond just climate emissions, but the total environmental footprint of food production that we can make a really big difference. And where California goes, a lot of the country and the world goes. And then at the national level, things like the Farm Bill, which is being renegotiated this year, but other national policies, you know, it's a real way that we can make a difference at a national scale. I know it can feel hard for one voice to really be heard, but that's how our democracy works. And those who speak up can make a difference. So this is our chance to really to affect change at that local, uh, state, and, and national scale. 
So I end there. I hope those um, vignettes about key messages and some of those kind of uh, ideas about how you can make a difference in food production in your own diet and, and uh, at a policy level uh, resonate and things you can remember and take home with you. I'll just end with, uh, um, I guess, a, a story of of hope in this sense that like, even though it's a lot of information, it can be really fun to learn more about the food we eat. We do this in certain ways, like some people love to really learn about wines and which variety comes from where and what it tastes like and stuff. And if we can use that same passion for other ingredients, we can um, really have a richer experience with the food we eat while also improving the environmental sustainability of it. So even though it can feel like a lot, hopefully you can embrace the opportunity to learn as a way to enjoy the food we eat and make a difference. So I'll stop there and really happy to take questions and hear your thoughts. Uh, yeah, Robert. Oh, thank you. Wow, this research is so important. I have two very different questions. So one of them is uh, what, what can be done to charge the true cost for these impacts? And the other one is that it was interesting that you showed this image of a dog looking at a burger. I've seen uh, figures from this Australian study that said that uh, a typical medium-sized dog has the same impact as two SUVs. Um, did you include carnivorous pets in, in your study, food production? Yeah, so uh, to the first one, there are many, many discussions about how to incorporate the true cost of food production. Most of them focus on the climate emission side of this. So there's things like carbon tax that have been discussed. And if we you know, really incorporated the true you know, cost of climate emissions into all sorts of things, but including food production, you'd see a very different cost of, for example, beef, because it's just got a lot of climate emissions. There's been less discussion about similar types of uh, mechanisms to account for the other environmental costs of food production. Like pollution is certainly one that in theory you could could keep track of. It's a, a much more difficult accounting exercise than climate emissions to, to track all that. And uh, same with some of the other kinds of environmental pressures. People talk about it less so than with climate emissions. Getting um, uptake and traction for that to happen is, if you've paid attention to the policy debates, difficult. So I, I don't want to sound naive and say, oh yeah, if we, we just need to do that and we'll solve the problem. I think it's really challenging to get our um, our capitalistic approach to um, you know food production to to do that. Um, to your second question, we don't track where the food gets consumed yet. We're working on that right now. It's a huge, huge challenge to track global food trade and figure out who is consuming food that's grown in different places. So basically our food production information I've shown you here, accounts for that food that ultimately goes into um, dog food and other pet foods as well. We just have not yet disentangled that in our data. So technically it's included, but I can't tell you what proportion goes to pet food. Uh, chat question, what role does organic and GMO food play? So um, <clears throat> we do not have global data on, on the production extent of those or all of the pressures associated with them at a global scale. There's local studies on that. So I can't answer that. We didn't include it in our studies. So I can't answer that at a, at a global scale. What I, I can tell you, at least on organic food, there's gonna be a tough pill to swallow, but it's not particularly efficient. Um, <clears throat> it's just, you know, the technologies we've developed for non-organic food makes them much more efficient environmentally. That doesn't mean you shouldn't buy organic. That's, you know, there's other reasons to buy organic food, but from an environmental sustainability perspective, they tend to be just universally less efficient. In fact, I'm at, the reason I'm on the road, I'm at a conference, a scientific conference where this is one of the things we're, we're actually talking about. And there's uh, some data that was just shown on um, organic 
um, farms have to till the soil more in order to get the, the nutrients that are needed into the soil for the plants to grow. Uh, and that more frequent tillage creates more emissions, uh, significantly more emissions, and degrades the other aspects of soil health. So it's uh, an unfortunate like aspect of organic food. It's, it's good for other reasons, but in terms of environmental sustainability, it's actually maybe not the best choice. GMOs, I don't know enough about to speak to that. So apologies. Um, all right. So I'm wondering how you measure footprint as a common unit across such disparate factors. I'm not even sure how you quantify disturbance. So I don't know if you can give us some word about that. Yeah, absolutely. As, as a scientist, I love questions about the under the hood methods. So happy to dive into that. And you're right. One of the challenges of coming up with a single metric, a cumulative metric that combines things is exactly how you compare apples and oranges. In this case, it's quite a literal metaphor, not just a, a virtual one. But yeah, how do you compare things that are really different? <clears throat> and the way you do that is you normalize each individual part to some reference point. So each pressure gets scaled essentially from zero to one. And then the big question is, is what is the one, right? <clears throat> and what we did in this case is we rescaled each pressure to the percent of the total cumulative footprint from that pressure. So any given place on the planet is some proportion of the total. And so each individual pressure is essentially a, a proportion. And then we can sum those proportions together. So they become on similar, actually identical units. And that's how we can combine them. What I think your question is maybe hinting at and, and is an important, really important distinction is that we look at the pressures from these food productions, the ultimate impact they have on the, on the environment depends on a whole bunch of context variables and the what kind of impact you're focused on. So you can focus on impacts to biodiversity, impacts to human health, impacts to human economies, a lot of other impacts. And the relative importance of each of those four pressures will vary. How much you weight one versus the other will vary depending on which kind of impact you're interested in and what the context of a place is. And we don't, because that's so complex, that's not part of our analysis, but that's how you would weight differently those four components to understand the, the, con the relative consequence of each of those together. So I, I went past your question. The methodology parts, I hope I explained. I'm happy to try again if I didn't do a good job, but it's the question is at a root of a really important part of our study. Have you? Uh, 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 I'm wondering, your data was so amazing. And, and something I've thought a lot about is how much footprint an individual human being has. And I know that that matters what continent, country, and whatnot we're from. Um, but have you uh, gone through any analysis of what kind of a minimum optimum amount of nutrient you know, intake a human being needs and then maybe use that as your baseline. And then here's an Amer average Americans like 10 X that or whatever the number is, right? The average Indian is, you know, half of that, or, you know, just, it'd be really interesting to know from a, from a carbon footprint Im impact that every single human being has, or at least you know, averages per region type of thing. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're doing now. So the extension of this work that we're underway right now is to, now that we have all this spatial information on where these pressures are, we want to know who consumes them. So we're we're tackling that trade question. And once we do that, which we're close, we then are going to look at the consequence of different diet recommendations um, for each country and globally. So in some countries, like, a, you know, you have... Um, well, we have our own USDA recommended diet, or you have the Mediterranean diet, or you have, we have a kind of a uh, uh, average healthy diet from different countries recommendations. So there's a bunch, we've picked four or five to focus on. 
and we're running basically scenarios. Like if every country, every person in every country were to eat this recommended diet, what would that mean for the health outcomes for those people? And what would it mean for the environmental sustainability implications? And so you're right, some countries will need to eat actually more in order to achieve those recommended diets. And some countries will have to eat a lot less to achieve those recommended diets. And we'll be able to then say, a person in India versus the United States, their current diet is doing this, and then their shift to a different recommended diet will change their own footprint, but then the global footprint in these ways. So it's, it's we're getting at that question. We're just not there yet. Uh, I have a follow-up on the methodology. I noticed for wheat and rice, a really large part of the contribution is water. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about how you account for disparities in, in the sources of that water. So, for example, a gallon of water that's fossil water pumped out of an aquifer in Kansas is very different than a gallon of water that falls on a rice paddy in Southeast Asia because they just fall out of the sky for free over there. But Kansas obviously has significance. So... Do you think about that? How do you think about water sources and production and how you account for the impact? Yeah, we keep, they're called green and blue water, those differences of those two sources, ones that are kind of come naturally from the sky and those that we extract. And we account for those as separate accounting exercises. So we do have that information um, embedded in these results. And so, um, right, uh, we we know the source of that water, the Part of your question is actually getting at the impact side of it. So um, water extracted from you know, ancient groundwater is going to have a much larger long-term impact on environmental uh, variables that we care about than taking some of the, the rainwater that's falling naturally, although both will have impact because you're taking water out of a natural system that otherwise would, would be there. So yes, we account for it. Um, we know the proportion for any given food in any given place that comes from those different sources, but we don't track it to what that means for the environment in different places because that gets into the impact measure. It is a it is a, a massive accounting exercise, and we know there's imperfections for sure because you know you're only as good as the data that you can get your hands on, and there's certainly some errors in those data. But it's yeah the first time this has been done, so we hope that. And all of these data are freely available for anyone to use. So we hope that people continue to improve on this moving forward. Related to that, there's a question in the chat about how you get statistics from China. Yeah, uh, you're right. They don't share some stuff, but they do share. Every country is required to share um, uh, data on food production to things like the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO. <laughs> So we leverage a lot of the data and information reported there. So yes, there's always a chance that countries aren't accurate in what they report. There's been cases where uh, China has been known to exaggerate their production on some things to meet um, the government's expectations. So we know there's going to be error in some of that, but all of that stuff gets reported. We then use lots of additional information about studies that have been done in different countries that report the environmental pressures associated with food in particular places, those are published in other sources. So it's a huge um, exercise to track down as much information as possible and combine that all together. But we don't have access, obviously, to China's statistics books where they, they, they keep all this, these records. I had a question about nutrients. The nutrient part of the crops, uh, is that runoff or... Um, where would like the emissions involved in creating fertilizer or other chemicals put on crops be? Right. So um, the nitrogen and phosphorus pollution from crops is from fertilizers, right? So there's excess runoff <clears throat> when the, the ground or the plants don't take up all of that um, fertilizer, it runs off into the watershed. So um, that's a big part of the pollution. There's other um, atmospheric um, emissions of nitrogen and stuff that come from farm equipment and things. So there's some of that as well. Um, <clears throat> and then um, I'm now forgetting the second part of your question. The emissions from creating fertilizer. Oh, yes. And, um, right. So we um, we uh, we have 
what we call farm to gate data. So what is produced on the farm until it reaches the gate of the farm. We don't keep track of transportation miles and emissions from getting the food from the farm to your grocery store or to its ultimate source. Um, and some of the like input things like the emissions to create a tractor that is then used on your farm, we don't have those in there as well. Uh, it's just, it's actually pretty common. Most of the um, study, the results you've seen for food comparisons do the same. They call it farm to gate. It's just kind of what's at the, the farm itself. You've probably also seen studies that look at like cradle to grave assessments of every aspect of emissions in the production of a uh, pound of corn, for example, that would account for the climate emissions from fertilizer. We don't have that in our assessment. Um, some of those things are um, uh, non-trivial amounts. They, they, they add some. There's other things like transportation miles have been shown to be actually a pretty tiny percentage of the emissions associated with food. So that not having that isn't a, a huge deal um, in our global accounting. It, it is a part of the equation for sure, but it's not a big part. Okay, hey, Robert. Um, yeah, sorry, two more questions, please. I, I love clams and I, I know that's great environmentally, but they're very expensive. And I'm curious why, um, maybe it's the transportation issue, but one other question is about eating insects. Um, there, would you agree that uh, if people could get over their irrational behavior about that, that eating some certain insects would be a great benefit? Yeah, uh, why clams are expensive? Shellfish in general are more, mussels are not, clams and oysters are. Some of that is market dynamics of, of marketing the product. And so they um, just get a premium for doing that. Um, and some of it is just the, there's higher costs of production. So that's just passed on. Um, and it does raise the issue of equity, like not everyone can afford to, to eat those foods. And so there's concerns there. Insects, uh, yeah, they're not uh, at a large enough scale and not reported to, for us to have included in our assessment, but um, it is certainly a very interesting one. What I know of them is they're really hard to grow at scale. Um, it's really hard to um, cultivate the right environmental conditions to grow like a gazillion insects at a time. And that's what you need to really scale up insects as a key component of our food production system at very small scales is definitely doable and it, they're unbelievable sources of protein and they don't take a lot of inputs to grow them. So it, it's compelling. It's this scaling issue that's been really challenging um, to keep it from growing much bigger. A question from Cliff about tilapia and they are technically vegetarian fish, but a lot of farmers have started eating them, feeding them <clears throat> these feed components to make them grow faster. So uh, it's hard to know whether the tilapia you'd get in the store has been fed something or is just vegetarian. So unfortunately, it's it's hard to, to know for sure. In general, uh, they, they are lower on the food chain so that they are more like vegetarian, um, but uh, they um, are shifting more and more towards being a fed animal. Question. So um, in terms of influencing government and changing the way that our government subsidizes different agriculture sectors, um, obviously it's really important what individual changes we make, but we want to have a greater change overall in order to actually influence the climate. Um, and so one question I had was um, environmental organizations have a much larger a platform than individual people do, um, but I know it's been difficult to get them on board with talking about these issues. Um, do you have any insights on that and how we individuals can help maybe pressure environmental organizations to pay more attention to this? Yeah, fantastic point and, and really good question. Um, you're right, they, they have people whose job it is to know how to influence policy in, in ways that I certainly don't know. So it's great to take advantage of their expertise to do that. I know that um, there are um, definitely 
organizations that are thinking about NGOs that are thinking about the climate dimensions of food production. Some of the, most of the big ones, you know, Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, Conservation International, Environmental Defense Fund, the really big national and international ones definitely have groups that are working on the emission side of food production. But um, there are other groups like in California, there's a, an NGO called Roots of Change that's really working to understand how food um, shifts in food policy can um, influence what happens in the state of California. And they've got some real policy experts there. And then I would say one, um, one message I, I hope you kind of gathered from this is that aquaculture is actually not that bad and, and, and certainly not as bad as many people painted. And definitely things like seaweed and shellfish aquaculture are like really amazing. I mean, see, I didn't talk about seaweed because it's not in our data, but seaweed is even better than shellfish. It's like, you know, you don't feed it. It pulls nutrients out of the water. It helps sequester carbon to fight um, you know, climate change. It creates habitat. You can use it for food, but you can also use it for biofuels or carrageen or other products. Like it's kind of this like amazing thing. And so aquaculture of, of seaweed and, and shellfish is really an amazing opportunity to increase our food production and actually make you know, environmental benefits for our oceans. But there's a lot of pushback, especially in California, to allowing aquaculture in our oceans. And you see that across many of the ocean NGOs as well. Um, and my personal take on that is it stems from a an antiquated understanding of what aquaculture used to be and not on a modern understanding of what aquaculture is. And so talking to uh, local and national NGOs that focus on ocean issues is a real opportunity to speak to the power of aquaculture in particular for being an important part of our food system that is nutritious and sustainable. Um, not always, nothing that, no food is 100% perfect. But aquaculture has an opportunity to play a really big role in, in making a difference. And there's some NGOs that are actively fighting aquaculture um, because they see it as a threat to conservation. But the irony is it's probably actually a, a conservation benefit and they're fighting the wrong fight. So there's an opportunity, at least from my perspective, to make a difference. Do you track the environmental impacts of land use change as more land is brought into agricultural use? We do not track land use change because that's change over time. And it was so hard to do just a single year snapshot. Uh, we couldn't do that. But you're, it is clearly one of the most important drivers of change in food production. The stories you hear of Amazon and other places of, of hab severe habitat loss as it gets converted into grazing fields or soy plantations is huge. So if we were to redo our analysis for another year, we would need to and would be able to account for land use change. It's not in our assessments that I showed you here. So it's another, like everything I've shown you is, is conservative for sure. Uh, the environmental footprints are greater than what I showed you. Uh, if you accounted for land use change, especially in <clears throat> tropical areas and developing countries where it's happening quite rapidly, you'd see certain foods probably change their, well, you'd definitely see them change their cumulative footprint and you might see them change their rank order because of that. Any questions from anyone? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. your time. Absolutely. I'm just putting up my um, contact information again. Uh, feel free to reach out by email if you have questions or follow up. And yeah, I would love to stay in touch if you have ideas. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for your time. It's really fun to have a chat with y'all. Great. Thank you very much. And Thank good you. to see, see other people here, both uh, in person and hybrid. Yeah. And uh, we'll be getting out word about our next meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.